The first reaction from our hydride reduction family is the treatment of aldehydes, ketones, or acid chlorides with sodium borohydride, followed by an acid quench. As we've already discussed in chapter 18, if you take an aldehyde, treat it with sodium borohydride, the H- comes right into that carbonyl carbon, thrusts the electrons onto the oxygen, which then gets quenched, giving me a primary alcohol. If I do the same reaction with a ketone, the H- comes up, electrons go up onto the oxygen, it gets quenched with the acid and gives me a secondary alcohol. If I take sodium borohydride and react it with an acid chloride, the H- goes up to uh, this carbonyl carbon, electrons go up onto the oxygen, then the electrons come down and kick off the chloride. That gives me a temporary aldehyde intermediate. Unfortunately, I can't stop there. A second molecule of sodium borohydride comes in, thrusts in a second H-, uh, pushing the electrons up onto the oxygen and then getting it protonated during the quench, reducing my acyl chloride all the way down to a primary alcohol. Also, as we already highlighted back in chapter 18, lithium aluminum hydride is a stronger reducing reagent than sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride generally won't touch carboxylic acids or esters. Thus, we have to use lithium aluminum hydride, the big guns, which adds two successive H- into the carbonyl carbons of these uh, starting materials, ultimately reducing them all the way down to primary alcohols. For a review of these reactions, please consult my chapter 18 video lecture. Lithium aluminum hydride can also be used to reduce amides, which sodium borohydride once again won't touch. Unlike carboxylic acids and esters, though, when amides are treated with lithium aluminum hydride, they get reduced down to amines. Thus, if I begin with this kind of amide and I treat it with lithium aluminum hydride followed by a water quench, I go all the way down to this amine. This amide, which is an amide in which the nitrogen has a methyl on it, gets reduced under the same conditions to this, a secondary amine. And if I take this kind of amide in which the nitrogen has two methyls or any other alkyl group you can think of and treat it under the same conditions, it gets reduced all the way down to this tertiary amine. Now, if you want to review any of these reactions, I invite you to go back and watch my lecture video from chapter 18. So what if I have an ester and I only want to reduce it to an aldehyde instead of going all the way to the primary alcohol? What can I do? Do I have to use some magical reagent, like fairy dust or unicorn tears? No, I don't. What I do is I use this reagent. This reagent is called diisobutyl aluminum hydride, or diball. Di ball. Di ball. When I stir an ester at negative 78 degrees Celsius, with diball, I can selectively reduce it down to the aldehyde and stop rather than going all the way to a primary alcohol. Now, I've got to be honest, there are five moments in my life that I would consider to be the most amazing experiences I've ever had. The first one is when my wife and I got married. The second, third, and fourth are when my three children were born. And the fifth is when I learned this reaction. Yeah, actually, I'm lying. This reaction isn't quite that exciting, but it's you know still okay, and I still want you to know. Now, because sodium borohydride is strong enough to reduce ketones and aldehydes, but too weak to touch esters or carboxylic acids, you can use sodium borohydride to selectively reduce an aldehyde or ketone group in a compound like this. You'll notice that this compound has an ester and a ketone in it. Once again, sodium borohydride will not touch the ester. It's not strong enough. But it will reduce the ketone to an alcohol. So if I have a compound like this, react with sodium borohydride followed by water or acid quench, I can get this product in which the ketone group has been reduced only and the ester has been left untouched. Now just so you know, alkenes and alkynes do not possess a partial positive charge the way a carbonyl carbon does. Thus if you take an alkene or an alkyne and or try to reduce it with sodium borohydride, you get no reduction reaction occurring. This is also a useful detail to know, just in case you have a compound that has a ketone and an alkene or an alkyne in the same compound. You can selectively reduce the ketone or aldehyde and leave the alkene and alkyne alone. 
We now turn back to chromium oxidation reactions, which we first covered back in chapter 10. As you might remember, if I take a primary alcohol and treat it with this dihydrogen chromate, or chromic acid, I can oxidize it all the way up to a carboxylic acid. Now, presumably, the aldehyde intermediate does exist along the way, but it's uh, not able to be isolated. In fact, this oxidizing reagent is so powerful that it does take the primary alcohol all the way up to the carboxylic acid. If I take a secondary alcohol, however, and treat it under the same conditions, it goes to the ketone. The reason is because I only have a single hydrogen in a secondary alcohol bound to this carbon that can be removed and replaced with a, an extra bond of the oxygen. In a primary alcohol, in contrast, I've got two hydrogens that can be removed and replaced with net gain bond to oxygen. Thus, a primary alcohol being oxidized under these, these conditions gives carboxylic acid, and a secondary alcohol gives a ketone. Now you might wonder, well, how in the world can I get an aldehyde if I want to? Well, once again, you may remember that if I start with a primary alcohol and treat it with PCC, which is a milder oxidizing reagent, I can go up to an aldehyde and stop. PCC only goes up one net bond to oxygen and stops. Now you should keep in mind, however, that secondary alcohols only have a single hydrogen, and thus, when you oxidize them with PCC, we go up one net bond to oxygen to form a ketone. So a secondary alcohol, when treated with PCC, gives a ketone just like the chromic acid oxidation also gives a ketone from a secondary alcohol. Now be prepared. The reaction I'm about to teach you is absolutely revolutionary. It's apocalyptic. It's intense. It will bring kings to their knees, empires to ruin, and monkeys to clearance sales at Walmart. It is the Bayer Villiger oxidation. In this reaction, if I begin with an aldehyde or a ketone and treat it with a peroxy acid, what I will get is a carboxylic acid or an ester, respectively. So once again, I want you to look at that. An aldehyde treated with peroxy acid gets an oxygen inserted between the hydrogen and the carbon, giving me a carboxylic acid. Similarly, a ketone treated with a peroxy acid gets an oxygen inserted between the carbonyl carbon and one of the alkyl groups, giving me an ester. Now, I don't want you guys to confuse this reaction with the one that we learned earlier back in chapter 4. As you might recall, if I have an alkene and I treat it with a peroxy acid, this alkene gains a bond to oxygen to convert into an epoxide. Please don't get these two reactions mixed up. Although they involve the exact same reagent, a peroxy acid, they do completely different things. Once again, bayer villiger oxidation uses peroxy acid to convert an aldehyde into a carboxylic acid or a ketone into an ester. While this epoxidation reaction takes an alkene and converts it into an epoxide using the same conditions. So you might wonder, what if I use a peroxy acid on a molecule that has both an alkene and an aldehyde or a ketone in it? Will I do an epoxidation or will I do a bayer villiger oxidation? My carefully calculated answer to that question is yes. Now let's examine using a bayer villiger oxidation with an asymmetrical ketone. Here's my ketone. I treat it with my peroxy acid. The question is, where does the oxygen go? Does the oxygen go in between the carbonyl carbon and this methyl? Or does the oxygen go between this carbonyl carbon and this cyclohexyl group? The answer to that question is simple. In general, a hydrogen atom always gets moved the easiest. So if this were an aldehyde, the oxygen will always go in between the hydrogen and the carbonyl carbon. If you've got a ketone, however, then the oxygen ends up going, in general, between the carbonyl carbon and the more substituted carbon group, according to this convoluted looking trend. <sighs> which to be quite honest is hard to follow unless you're a gypsy with a crystal ball or you possess the ability to derive the Schrodinger equation in your sleep. In any event, I don't require you to know this trend, but if your curiosity persists more deeply and you really want to know why this trend is the way it is, you can talk to me during or outside of class. Now to me this seems like a great place for us to end. 
please rest, and while you're sleeping, leave all of your valuables at the following address. 3255 West New Hampton Haven at Chicky Parang Drive. I'll see you during our next lecture.